Hi, welcome to my talk on accessibility. Accessibility for all, the benefits of inclusive design is the title of my talk. And the purpose of my talk is to convince you that developing software with accessibility in mind is not only the right thing to do, but it also makes for a great user experience for everyone. And if you need good arguments to convince your boss to invest in accessibility, this talk is also for you. I'm Felix. I'm a software engineer at Iteratech. We are a consultancy based in Germany. We build cool stuff for other companies. I do full stack web development. I do front end, back end, and a bit of DevOps by the side. But most importantly, I like trains. Now, I'm a big fan of public transportation. I don't have a car and I take the train whenever possible. And recently I noticed that my city's metro system is constantly bragging about the improvements in accessibility that they've made in the past years. Now, I live in Hamburg, Germany, and the transportation network in my town claims they have 95% of the metro stations made accessible. That's a pretty good number compared with other cities. Most other cities have like 20 something, 30 something percent. Of course, there is also a lot of cities who are doing better, like Amsterdam, for instance. Um, so if you're coming to Jay's World Amsterdam, you might as well take the train because it's 100% accessible. And it's not just trains in Amsterdam, it's also the buses and the trams and everything. So what does it even mean? When is a station accessible? And basically, it means three things. First, there is an elevator to bring people down to the platform or up to the platform, wherever it is. And second, there is step-free access onto the train. So there's no difference in elevation between the platform and the train. And third, there are automatic doors. So I don't know if the train in the picture has manual doors, but it looks a bit older. And some of these older trains had really heavy manual doors where you needed a lot of force to open them. And that was pretty annoying and for some people not even feasible to do. So I'm glad we got rid of that mostly. Yeah. Um, but I found it a bit funny that my city's net metro network claims they made everything accessible. And what they mean by it is building elevators because I personally use an elevator every day. Uh, my building has an elevator. I'm really grateful for it because I'm just lazy and I don't like to take the stairs, but I'm not really dependent on it. That's why I never thought of an elevator as an accessibility device. But of course they are. It makes total sense. Without an elevator, a lot of people couldn't get where they're going. And basically, all modern buildings have elevators. No one says, do we really need one? How many people depend on them? Maybe we can cut costs somewhere here. Yet in web development, we constantly hear that it's too expensive to make something accessible. We get asked, how many people does it affect? Is it really worth the effort? And the answer to that question surprised me actually, because it affects 1.6 billion people worldwide. According to the World Health, Health Organization, one in six people experience significant disability. And the number might be different in your country, especially in richer countries with good health systems. It's different. It's not as, as, as extreme. Uh, for example, in the Netherlands, it's still one in 10 people. So 10% have a disability in the Netherlands, which is still a big number. Take the exact numbers with a grain of salt. It's not always clear what counts as a disability, but it doesn't really matter at what study you're looking at. The outcome is always you're missing out on a huge market. But the point that I'm trying to make with this talk isn't actually that it's a huge market you're missing on, out on, but that all the people who do not have a disability also benefit from design with ex ex designing with accessibility in mind. So how do we design or build something with accessibility in mind? Let's have a look at the web content accessibility guidelines for that. And they look like this. It's actually just a huge wall of text. And if you scroll through them, it doesn't get any better. It's just text, no pictures, no fun, and not really inviting to read through them. I know because I have. Um, but it doesn't really matter if you're familiar with WCAG. It's also known as WCAG for short. It sounds a bit odd, but that's the abbreviation they use. Um, but I'll pick some examples from, from the guidelines, and I'll tell you about how those guidelines are made 
or intended for people with disabilities, but how they also help other people who do not have an impairment. Now, what are the groups of people that WCAG targets? Basically, these four groups. There are users of screen readers, users with low vision, users with dyslexia, and users with limited motor skills. And it's important to know that you're not either in this category or not in this category, because not all of these impairments are permanent. Some of them can be temporary or situational. Imagine you're missing one arm. That's probably permanent. It's not going to grow back. But if you break your arm, you still have the same impairment, but it's not forever. It's going to be in a cast for six weeks, and then you're back to normal. But during this time, you can't really use it. It's, it's not of any use, basically. So you have something called a temporary impairment. And there are also a situational impairments because if you're just carrying something with one arm, you can't use it for anything else at this moment in this situation. Now, what does a website look like that builds for accessibility or that is built for accessibility? And if your website looks something like this, you're pretty, you're pretty good to go. Like this is perfect. There is a navigation that is using the navigation tag. There is a list that is using the list tag. There are links that are using the href tag. And there's a heading that is using the heading tag. So that's perfect. That's really easy to follow, really easy to read. And a screen reader is going to tell the user, hey, there's a navigation. There are links in this navigation. Do you want to click on them or do you want to go straight to the main section? The main section has a heading that says accessibility. That's really easy to understand. But unfortunately, most websites today do not look like this. Modern websites often look more like this. A bunch of div containers, a bunch of spans that have no semantic meanings to them. And it's really hard to navigate. To a seeing user, this, these might be the same sites. This could look completely alike. The, the spans with the menu items could be styled as links. They could have a cursor pointer attached to them. They could be underlined to indicate those are links. The accessibility heading could be really big, styled as a heading, even though it's a span. Um, but to a screen reader, that's just nonsense. It's just a bunch of generic container containers with no meaning to them. So yeah, not really great for screen readers and also not great for all users actually, because a link, an href tag has some more functionality to it than just you can click on it. You can also open a link in a new tab or you can hover over a link and see where it leads to. You can copy the URL of, the, of that link. None of this is going to happen if you have just a JavaScript action attached to a span tag, unless you specifically implement that, which you're probably not going to do if you, if you do it like this. So please don't do that. Um, please stick to semantic HTML. It does not only benefit users of screen readers, but virtually everyone else too. And when you're sticking to semantic HTML, you're almost forced to have some structure in your website. So that's another point that's in WCAG. You must have some structure. Um, that doesn't just mean you, you want to use semantic HTML, but that also means you're not going to change where your navigation is on every, on every page. Like if you click on a different page and everything is different, that's not great. That's not great for screen readers because they have to rethink again how your website works. But it's also not great for people who are just trying to find some information on your website as fast as possible without reading the entire page from front to finish. Because most people don't want to do that because that's very time consuming and annoying. So if you have a good structure, it's great for all of those users who just skim through your website. Another thing in WCAG is contrast. Obviously, this is intended for people with low vision. If your contrast is really low, it can be hard to see what's going on on your website for some people. But low vision doesn't have to be something you either have or not have, because once you view a website on a projector or with sunlight on your screen, you might not be able to see as much. And then basically, 
you're you're in a situation where yourself you you yourself have low vision even though your eyesight is perfect so that's something that you should also consider but now let's step away from the wicker examples and look at a real life example for now this is the bendy straw the bendy straw was invented in the 1930s you might have seen a straw like this it's virtually everywhere and um, the inventor was called joseph friedman and he made it for his daughter because his daughter had trouble drinking from a straight paper straw and when he advertised his invention in the 1930s he specifically targeted hospitals his target audience were epileptics and people lying in bed sick he didn't really think of this as a straw that everyone can use it was more like a medical medical device but today at least i don't think of a flexible straw as a medical device it's just a very convenient way to drink something and by the same token there are innovations in tech that were intended for people with impairments but today are used by almost everyone so let's have a look at captions captions are another thing that are in wicked and they're obviously great for people with hearing impairments but i use captions all the time and i don't have a hearing impairment that is because i like to eat chips when i watch tv and if you've tried you know it's not really easy to understand what's going on on the television um because you can't hear as much if you're crunching on a chip so that's why i use captions also when i try to learn a new language i use captions because i might not be as advanced in this language and it's easier to follow if i can see what's going on written and i can hear it at the same time or you want to watch a movie that is completely foreign in a foreign language that you don't know at all you might use subtitles and have everything that's being said translated in another language another case for captions is if you want to watch a video in the office you forgot your headphones you don't want to blast the audio through the entire office just watch it with the captions turn off the sound easy as that and what I found is that uh, YouTube has made a really cool way to utilize captions for everyone, not just those who actually need them. Um, they have made a new function on, their, on the For You page, on the main page, where you can hover over a video and it just starts playing with captions, but without sound. It looks like this. So the video starts to play. There's no sound. You can enable the sound if you want to but per default it's just the captions and no sound and i find this is really a cool feature because when i'm on the front page of youtube and i go across the entire screen with my mouse i might be hovering over 10 different videos and if they would all start to play with sound one after another that would be very annoying but with the captions i can get a peek of what's in the video and i can decide if i want to start watching it with sound in its entirety now, another guideline that we find in WCAG is keyboard navigation. Keyboard navigation, sorry. Um, it's obviously intended for people with limited motor skills. Some people just can't use a mouse. But how can everyone else benefit from keyboard navigation? And if you're a developer, chances are you don't like to use a mouse. A lot of developers, and myself included, just prefer to use keyboard shortcuts in their IDE. Or maybe they live in their terminal entirely. Then I ask myself, why is it that we constantly forget about implementing keyboard navigation when we build web apps, even though we as developers usually don't like to use the mouse? And I learned the same goes for finance people who basically live in Microsoft Excel. They don't like to use the mouse either. Of course, I get it. It's, it's annoying. It's annoying to switch from the mouse to the keyboard. It takes time. A lot of things can be done faster if you just stick to the keyboard. So please uh, implement keyword navigation if you build something for the web. You also need to give your user enough time to do something. Enough time, how much is enough time? Um, that's not really clear. So usually that means no timing at all. Think of a carousel that shows you the next slide after like 10 seconds. That's not great because it might be too slow for some, too fast for others. But if you have to do it, just give the user some control over the slides, give them some option to pause the slideshow. 
we'll go back or go to the next slide. Some navigation, that would be great in this case. Um, I'm sure you have seen these tours that some web websites give you to show off cool new features or when you sign up, they want to introduce you to all the features the website has. I personally skip these tours mostly. Um, because when I visit a website, I do it with a purpose. I want to get something done as fast as possible. And I don't want to learn about all the features the website has. Maybe I'm just interested in one specific feature and I don't want to bet on it coming up in the tour, but sometimes it does. And when it does, I probably already have clicked next once I realized that was a feature that I was interested in that I actually want to learn about. And uh, Wikic calls these kind of tours an interruption because they ask for your intention, even though you just clicked on a link where you actually wanted to do something entirely else. Um, and Wikic asks you to make these interruptions postponable and make the user able to come back to these kind of tours, interruptions, modals, whatever it is. And that doesn't just benefit users who need more time to read something in a carousel or in a slideshow or whatever, but it also um, benefits those who just skip through everything because they think they know it all and realize after they click next, they want to go back. So put in a back button, that's great. Now another thing in Wikic is resizable text. And if you think about a user that has like 150% increase in, in the text size set in their browser, you're probably thinking of a person like her, an elderly person. But it turns out it's really not just the elderly who fumble with these settings. It's also a lot of teenagers, specifically with Android phones, who love to customize everything. They have custom fonts and they also have custom font sizes. Some increase the text, some decrease the text size. So it's always better to use relative units like RAM instead of absolute units like pixel if, if you're styling text, because it should be resizable by these browser functions. And um, I've even seen a tweet of some startup founder who realized that 20% of his user base, of, of his teenage user base, were using Zoom mode. So that's a huge number. Um, he also admitted his sample size wasn't that big, but you get the idea. It's it's not just the elderly who use this. And even if you target a younger audience, they might use Zoom mode. They might have increased the text size. Now, that's all I have concerning Wikic for now. Um, but you get something in addition to following all these guidelines. You get something on top for free, something that could potentially make you a lot of money, and that is search engine optimization. And it's quite simple. You get better rankings with accessible websites. And that is because if you optimize your websites to be working with screen readers, a machine, it also works well with other machines like a search engine crawler. So yeah, you get that on top. You have a real ROI instantly on, on your investment in accessibility. Um, but if you're still not convinced, I guess I need to take some legal actions. <laughs> Your country might already have a law about accessibility. You might already be forced to have some accessibility on your websites. But if that's not the case today, it could come in a couple of years. So America has the Americans with Disabilities Act um, that has been around for a long time but there are iterations and it becomes stricter with every iteration. And the same goes for Europe. There is the European Accessibility Act that is coming in two years, um, but a lot of European countries already have something in place. And uh, once you wanna go into these markets, you need to be accessible with your websites. So start implementing now because it's always easier to do it with accessibility in mind from, from the get-go instead of trying to put it on top after you're basically done with, with building the entire website. Um, that's an option, but it's a lot harder and it definitely takes some time. So 
when you're in the European market, maybe don't start in May 2025, but start now because it does take time. And maybe you can do it a little faster than New York's subway. They need 33 years to make their stations accessible, which I find a bit too slow because I believe the internet should be available to everyone. I believe public transportation should be available to everyone and accessible to everyone. So I can only say, let's build some elevators. Let's build a more inclusive internet. Thank you.